call it the mighty central limit theorem because you're going to get used to seeing this in 244. It's all over the place in 244. It's gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. So here's the point. I mean, you're never going to know what the population average is, but you want to know what it is. That's the point. You want to know if this drug is actually going to lower headaches in third-term mothers that have what I'm making stuff up now. But you want to know, whatever you're studying, you want to know if it has an effect. So you want to know what the average change or the average is. And the average, as we've already talked about for 10 weeks, has a plus or minus around it. It's got a plus or minus. It's got, it's got a sigma. So you draw a sample of size n. And you know what? I want to add one word to that. I mean, I'll just say it, not add it. And a randomly independent random sample. So in other words, you're drawing independently, like we do with the chickens. Sometimes, sometimes you can argue that it won't be independent, but if, you're, if your population is large enough and your sample is small enough, you can pretend it is. So it's like with the chickens, it works just fine. OK, so now you got your sample. Whew. Your sample has an average, which you're going to calculate. Lots in 244. And it's got a standard deviation, a little s, a standard deviation, OK? So that's, that's what you've got so far. So all you know at this point is you are somewhere on that bell curve. That bell curve we just looked at as we kept the, this, uh, the uh, sample size going up and up and up and up and up. Your sample is one of the pieces of one of those bars. But you don't know which one. You don't know which bar and which piece of which bar. Is that fair? So that was 10,000 samples or something, or 1,000 samples. You're just one of those thousands. So you could be that tail over here, couldn't you? You might be that tail, one in a thousand chance. You might be in the middle, say a two in a thousand chance. But you're somewhere on that on that graph. So that's where you start, knowing that. And this is where 244 starts as well. Number one, that distribution I just mentioned, and you guys already figured this out, is bell shape. Yay! <laughs> and not just that, you get a second yay. Because the hump of the bell is over mu. Double yay. I made up a symbol. I call it x double bar. Because what those graphs actually are, are the graphs of all the sample means. So the average of those averages is the hump of the bar. So I call it x double bar. Hope you don't mind. It's OK. So I'm just let, it, let it go. It's OK. So x double bar is mathematically equal. That's not an approximate. That's mathematically equal. If you want to see a proof of why, I put it on your original page of the website. At this point, you don't care anymore. That's OK. So that's two yays. We get the bell curve. Holy crap. And we know where the average is. The problem is, the problem, and this is going to go by too quickly to write down, guys. I'll have this posted for you ASAP, I promise. The problem is, your average most likely doesn't equal mu. See, here's the problem. Here's the problem. May I go back to this spreadsheet for just a second? I didn't wait for an answer. I apologize. So here, let's just pick 16 for an example, OK? So you can see that this bell curve, its average is 8.2. So all the possible averages that you can draw average to 8.2, where is your one sample average? It might be one of these. It might be that little hump right there. It might be this one. It might be that one. It might be this one. It might, it's, it's going to be one of them. It's obviously more likely that it's here than it is here because that bar is higher, but that's only 25% likely, yeah? There's still roughly a 12% chance you're going to land over here, which might be too far away to make you happy, correct? That might be too far away from average. Now you're shooting too wide. Is there a fix for that? Say, yes. what's the fix? Average. Make your sample bigger, because what happens to these as your sample gets bigger? Yes, they get smaller and go away eventually, and the middle gets taller. That's, that's, the, that's the cure. So the, the, this is a little bit of a boo, boo. But it's not that much of a boo, because this x bar does have a plus or minus on it. Yeah, that's standard error. So what I want to introduce you to is our good buddy, the standard error. We're going to call this the error bumper correction. You said it's square root of sample size. There it is right there. Well, you should. See, error bubble correction. That's what we have to do. The, this standard error, if you guys, the reason I like talking about it in 243 briefly is you guys might incur, encounter, encourage, encounter this term in your, in your research. When you're in your field, consuming journals in your research fields, you might incur, in, encounter something called standard error. Standard error is the same thing as standard deviation, except it's on inferential sampling distribution curves. They made up a new name for it. Why? Don't know. 
but it's when you try to take sample data and make it infer something with the population. So when you hear standard error, just realize it's standard deviation which you make it inferential. Same idea. This is one of my favorite results of all statistics. Your standard error, or the, the spread of those bell curves, is going to shrink by a factor of the sample size, square root, as your sample size gets larger. That's freaking awesome. All you got to do then is make your sample size large enough to get this small enough, and this is what 244, a big chunk of 244, focuses on. So the larger your sample, the tighter the bell curve, the harder it is to get that far away from average. That's the best part. You're not going to have those goofy, like, I'm off by 10%. Not if your sample's large enough, you won't be. Because you mathematically can't be off by that far. Ha! Ah, that's great. It's like your dad telling you to go to the garage. Ah, give me a half inch wrench. You come back with a, I don't know, seven eighths. He's like, that's not close enough. Well, it's within a margin of error. He's like, he's going to punch in the face. <laughs> come back, give me a half inch wrench with no margin of error. Okay, you better teach me again and 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 again. So I can trick it down. Same exact idea. Same exact idea. Okay, this might look terrifying. It's not. It's not. Your average, what you don't know, what you don't know, is going to be within two standard errors. Oh my god, what does this sound like? X bar minus two standard deviations, x bar plus two standard deviations. What does this sound like? 95% of bell-shaped data is within two standard deviations. What that means, what that means, this is so pretty cool. What that means is you set the curve up, you put these on it like this, and then you know 95% of the time the average is in there. You don't know exactly where, but you know you've trapped them. There's an old joke, statistics joke. Three, three statisticians go hunting in the woods. Bear hunt. They see a bear. First one jumps up. <laughs> Five feet to the right of the bear. Second one jumps up. Five feet to the left of the bear. The third one jumps up. We got him! Because that's how statistics works. You don't actually hit the target. You bound the target. These are the... <laughs> this is what you do. Because you can't know what... That's the bear. That's the bear. Left hunter, right hunter. You never know what the actual target is because the target's in the population. You can't actually see it like the hunter's whole bear. What you do is, you set up the bounds around it and say it's between this and this. As Americans, this is hard for us to process because we are used to seeing things like unemployment rate 6.8%. No, it's not. You're full of crap. The unemployment rate is a 6.8% plus or minus a percentage error. Tell me what it is. It's not 6.8%. As a matter of fact, the time you wasted time telling me that, it changed. So just give me the bounds, and the bounds most likely are where it is. You see what I'm getting at here? These bounds, you can actually calculate those bounds. X bar is your sample average. The standard error is the standard deviation of your sample. That means you can get this number and you can get this number, which means you trapped that number. Now, the problem is, what if this number is 0% and this number is 100%? Then you can say, okay, I know the proportion supporting Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election is between 0 and 100%. Pretty useless, right? Pretty useless. Got to get it tighter, correct? Well, that's where the Aaron Butler correction comes in now, doesn't it? The Aaron Butler correction comes in in that we can minimize this by increasing our sample size. You can't change your average. Your average is stuck. But since this guy here, your, your plus or minus, is inversely proportional to the sample size. That's because the sample size was in the denominator. Inversely proportional. As the sample size goes up, the error goes down. Which means we, we get precision. Precision is a term you might not have learned before. It's okay if you have, it's okay if you haven't. But this is yay to the fourth power. And here's why. Here's why. There's four targets. Well, yeah, duh. Suppose you're shooting at the bullseye on each of these targets. When you're shooting a gun, you can refer to two things. Accuracy and precision. Accuracy and precision. Which of those targets, let me see hands on this one, show me accuracy. Which of the, assuming, assuming you're shooting for the red, there's the uh, white circle bullseye in the middle. Which of those, Shelly, give me one that shows me accuracy. Bottom left. Bottom left shows me accuracy. How about another one that shows me accuracy? JT. I'm the two on the right. The two, the, two, the two on the right. But you're shooting for the bullseye in the middle. Is that accurate? Well, they're all come together. That's precision. Uh, Boom. Good. Love this. Love this distinction. Precision means whatever you're shooting at 
is tightly close together. The problem is these, this person is shooting at that, which means, yes, he's extraordinarily, or she is extraordinarily precise, but they're missing the target on average. See, I thought precision was on the machine, and accuracy was... Accuracy, okay, so accuracy is, I got, I got, I got, I'm filling Red Bulls. How big is a Red Bull can? 3.4 Let's do 12 ounces, make it make life easy. 12 ounces. That's a lot of Red Bulls. That's, that's a lot of Red Bulls, it probably is. I drank Red Bull once in my life, like 15 years ago, I thought I'd never do it again. Um, so, 12 ounces is a can. Machine fills those cans, right? The machine accurately has to fill to 12 ounces, which means it wants to fill it to around 12 ounces. That's the average it's shooting for. It's the average it's shooting for. However, you can have an average of 12 ounces, but what if some of the cans are being filled to 14 and some of the cans are being filled to 10? Well, that's still being averaged to 12, correct? But it's also inexcusably imprecise. So that's this case right here. You're hitting the average, but you're missing it greatly. This would be, we're filling, for example, the cans to 13 on average, but we're really close to the 13, 13.1, 12.9, 13.1, 12.9. So yeah, you're wicked precise, wicked tight, but you're missing the target. Does that make sense? So these two are clearly showing accuracy because those clusters are landing on the targets. These two are clearly showing precision because the clusters are, see the difference between accuracy and precision? Accuracy is how well you're getting to the target. Precision is the, if you will, it's the inverse of missing the target tightly, if, if that makes sense. It's a sample size correction. This one's neither accurate nor precise, right? You're missing the target and you're missing it poorly. With this one, it's like, oh, this is easy. I can, this is easy to fix, right? Adjust From a sharpshooter point of view? Adjust your sight. Adjust your sight. You're obviously got a good cluster. You think you're shooting at the target. You're actually missing it by a little bit. Just adjust it, make it better. This one here, how do you fix this? Pra practice, right, Eric? <laughs> practice more. <laughs> you're obviously you're obviously sighted correctly. You're just missing it too much, or shooting less wind, or something like that. How do you improve this? I guess probably shoot more too, get even tighter. But the thing is, the central limit theorem guarantees us we will never have this problem because these aren't accurate. The central limit theorem guarantees us accuracy back here, right here. It guarantees us that we're gonna be hitting the bullseye on average. But it doesn't guarantee us precision until we start increasing our sample size. And that's what this is all about. That's what this is all about. Whoops, right here, right here. This is always true, always. 95% of your data is gonna be between those two values. So if that's true, just keep moving those two values closer together, and that's still 95% of your data. 95% of your data. 95% of your data. The only way to do that is to increase your sample size to draw. Now, you can't change this. We already saw that, right? We already saw you can't change this. No matter how big your sample size is, X bar is always centered on you. Whether it's four, whether it's 100, whether it's 1,000. But this shrinks. This shrinks. And that's what you have control over. Larger the sample, the more precise your answer. You get the accuracy for free but your precision increases as your sample size increases. That's it. It's freaking awesome. That's the cornerstone of 244 and everything else you're doing statistically at your, not your jobs. So. Hot damn! For those of you who don't want to have 243, you can stop thinking about it. But just realize that it's working in the background whether you're thinking about it or not. Those of you in 244, we start with this uh, next term. When I say next term, I mean like three months, four months, whatever. Ha! So now you, on JT, now you know how to deal with the last couple questions on your exam that deal with this. Fair? Oh yeah, sure, Sean. This guy right here? Yeah, for sure. And I'm going to have this posted, bro. Okay. Okay, go for it, go for it. Thank you for returning the dice, much appreciated. Do you have the distribution? And you're in one more stats? Let me see it. Do you have it with you? Oh, crap. Do you? Let's take a look. Let's figure it out. Don't forget to turn your in-class quiz in if you did it. We'll pile over there on the side. Hopefully you didn't erase it. It might be just a data entry issue. Sometimes that happens. That's not it. Well, let's let's pull up let's pull up the uh, the screen on the screen. Let's grab the. Uh,